remain instrumental in the whole process of Africa's economic development. How true. A second thought, healthcare and social services. According to a World Health Organization report, you may want to listen to this, about 60% of healthcare delivery in Africa is orchestrated by the church and or faith-based platforms. This is substantial in the backdrop of the fact that public health provision is hampered by weak governance, management flaws, and limited financing. In general, African governments allocate arguably less than 10% of their budgets to health care, and as such, the health sector is characterized by a short supply of health workers, depleted and dysfunctional health systems, limited availability of essential drugs, and poor health infrastructures. I come from the northern part of Nigeria, and I can tell you that these are not just um, theoretical statements. Um, it's unfortunate when you get to some of these areas in Nigeria for a case study. I've traveled quite extensively across the African continent, and I've been met with very, um, very disappointing expressions of pain and you know, health issues, even across many supposedly cosmopolitan cities. Healthcare in Africa still remains a very serious issue, even among the organized African societies. In this difficult and challenging setting, church health services have dominated the provision of health care across the continent. Apart from missionary health facilities, the church has continued to play an invaluable role in offering preventive and curative medical services, particularly the local communities. The church has made significant contributions towards the primary health care program, such as provision of basic packages of health services to rural and underserved communities, assisting communities to develop and implement locally relevant and sustainable health programs, and ensuring access to health services for the most vulnerable and marginalized groups. The church health services have put more emphasis uh, on the most rural and isolated communities where no other health care provider exists. In remote and poor localities which do not have roads or good road networks and where people have to walk sometimes, and you believe this, for more than a day to reach the nearest hospital available, the church has maintained services that would easily have been abandoned by the state. This has not only served to bridge the gap in healthcare delivery, but also demonstrated the church's strong presence in uplifting the standard of such communities. The third area of focus in examining Africa's role is the area of economic empowerment, and particularly I'm looking at entrepreneurship, job creation, and social aid. The church has increasingly engaged in Africa's economic and social development by providing various supports and value-adding economic empowerment services for the well-being of the African people. For example, the church has been involved in giving both spiritual support and material contribution to the poor, the needy, and the less privileged within their churches and communities. I can tell you that myself and our organization have been actively involved in this wise. We've launched various programs. There currently is an agricultural empowerment program, and we've spent millions and millions of Naira just putting together um, professionals along that line to help train and empower people. This came as a response to the harsh economic reality that is plaguing Africa, and that includes Nigeria, even though the largest nation within the African continent. The church has been actively involved 
in collaborating with private organizations and governmental institutions to help create jobs, give professional career trainings and workshops, set up entrepreneurship and business programs to as many individuals and local communities at large. Many churches have been at the back of the rise of many startups and SMEs with a view to promoting economic empowerment within their regions and extending the same across the entire continent. Our fourth area of consideration, peace and religious tolerance. Hmm. I took a deep breath because this <laughs> is quite an interesting one. Religion has been a force of both good and ill in the stability of the African countries. This is the fact. In several destabilizing conflicts, conventional or low level, faith and religion have served as important undertones and sometimes as the outright basis for conflict and wars. Examples of these factors um, or examples of these kinds of incidences uh, uh, for a case study, the Boko Haram insurgency in northern Nigeria. This has largely been driven by extremist views. And then you may want to consider the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda that was formed in 1987 by Joseph Kony with the aim of overthrowing the Ugandan government of Yoweri Museveni and establishing a Christian theocratic state. In several other conflicts, religion has been an undertone, even if not a formal basis of conflict. In Nigeria, again, for instance, the conflict between the Fulani headsmen, many of you have heard this or probably followed the trend um, through the lens of media. The conflict between the Fulani headsmen and the farmers in the Middle Belt regions are often understood as fueled by land scarcity, grazing rights, and climatic change. But the truth is that they have a very strong religious undertone. The herdsmen are usually men of extremist views and practices. And the farmland communities they displace as part of the land grabbing program sometimes and most times are usually occupied or belong to Christian communities. This has been proven without any sense of prejudices, biases, or sentiments. In many regards, the law enforcement agencies on apprehending many of these um, this extremist herdsmen, most of them have been found to be people who sustain extremist views, and their victims have usually been people of uh, the Christian faith. But religion has also been a force for peace and peace building in Africa, contributing to possibilities for development. In Mozambique, for a case study, which experienced a 16-year civil war between Renamo and the Frelimo forces that left one million people dead and ended in 1992, Mozambique's churches played a decisive mediation role that ended the war. Interfaith religious groups have also played strong roles in peace building, in civil conflicts, in nations like Cote d'Ivoire and the Central African Republic. The church and many other religious bodies have played significant roles in the release and the freedom of many victims of kidnap and abductions as we have in many parts of Nigeria, including um, you know, the Middle Belt and so on and so forth. In fact, extending to all the African nations. I remember one time I returned from a meeting and I was met with a very serious distress call. And on responding, I was told that um, the abductors had taken some people that were affiliated to me. It was a group of people who had returned from a program and all of them were abducted and they were given 24 hours to present 50 million naira, else every one of them would be slaughtered. 
And because they were closely related to me, we mobilized, you know, to inform the law enforcement agents. But uh, clearly, there seemed to be only so much they could do. And sadly, we had to get people, even of other faiths, to be able to talk perhaps with the um, abductors, if they could show kindness and mercy, and you would not believe the cruelty that came, cruel statements from those conversations. Sadly, one was shot on the foot. Usually, those levels of mayhem are unleashed to get you to see that they are serious. Mm -hmm. To cut the long story short, we ended up spending up to 20 million naira, uh, even in the presence of law enforcement agents. Thankfully, they were all released. And we had the opportunity. You see, the challenge is when these people are released, they still are not fine. The trauma that they have to go through, some of them go through rape, some of them go through all kinds of traumatizing things, and it's one thing to get them free, then begin a process of constructive rehabilitation. Because some of them, even without the activity of terrorists, again, they may end up dying. The trauma becomes too much, you see. And so uh, I'm not just saying this as a lecture. These are realities that some of us have been forced to live with, especially when you become a leader within these regions, you cannot shy away from being part of the process that leads to some of these things. And so I'm just using that to point that the church has played very significant roles on this wise. Furthermore, the church has played significant roles in resolving ethnic and religious clashes in many parts of Africa. And in fact, have become partners with government and law enforcement agents in the promotion of peace, tolerance, and mutual respect. Religious bodies have actively organized peace concerts. Our organization has done that too as a case study. And so uh, my work started largely in Zaria for those of you who are familiar with Nigeria. And um, for many years, we experienced all kinds of religious crises. And so we came up with an initiative to hold periodic peace concerts. And the intent is not to advocate fanatism. I'll be talking a bit about that before I conclude my discourse. And we successfully brought people from all religions, taking away all kinds of prejudices and promoting love. And you wouldn't believe how productive these concerts were. People came. Um, we had all kinds of welfare activities and people, Christians, Muslims, and any other person in between, they came. And it was very productive. I can tell you today that I have very good friends that cut across the religious divides. Very productive discussions. We may not agree on the core matters of faith, but I do not think it's been enough reason to hate, to fight, and so on and so forth. Are we together? Okay, so... Um, religious bodies have actively organized peace concerts, interfaith forums, sport activities, and public discussions in many parts of Nigeria and sub-Saharan Africa with a view to bridging the gap of intolerance and promoting peace and mutual respect. Challenges and criticisms. Like every and any other system led and managed by humans, there will always be limitations, compromises, excesses, and ill practices. Faith, spirituality, and religion has had its share of the aforementioned challenges. This has led to criticisms from various quarters and strong reservations as to the overall relevance and practice of faith in our contemporary society today. There is still a lot of growth and improvement, truly, that needs to be brought to the current context of faith and spirituality, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Matters of neocolonialism by the religious and political elites, advocacy of laziness and irresponsibility through wrong and extremist teachings, lack of transparency and accountability in leadership, even Christian leadership, moral failures within faith-based systems, are all issues that whether now 
or in the future, I presume, will have to be confronted if the relevance of faith in nation building and social and economic development is to be preserved. My concluding thoughts. It is very clear that faith and spirituality still hold great significance in shaping the African continent as far as its future and destiny is concerned. But it is also very clear, and sadly so, that still falls short of its potential. I have a very brief discussion with um, the head of politics at the Abuja US Embassy. Subjects that we spoke about was um, the idea of the kinds of teachings that people become victims of the orientations that come to them. And because Africa is a very religious continent, uh, most of the ill thought and practiced in Africa, there will have to be a growing orientation that transits faith, spirituality, and religion from a mere advocacy of fanatism, societal transformation, and nation building to one that will, in greater measures, spearhead the campaign for moral excellence, honor to all men. We must introduce superior policies that stimulate great growth and development while preserving the fundamental human rights of all and sundry. This way, faith and religion will remain potent forces of change, socioeconomic development, and will become active the world at large. I hope that these thoughts that I've shared with us have helped us to really see that in the midst of all the conflicts that surround faith, spirituality, and religion, that from the lens of history and from the factors that I've put before you, I think it is safe to say that faith still holds value and relevance in our contemporary society, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, that was Apostle Joshua Selban. Can we make that round of applause more? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We may now have our seats. Okay, so... Um, I know that we're going to have a lot of questions to ask, so um, can we just put your thoughts together, make it very brief. If I tap my microphone, it means that your question is getting too long, all right? So put that together and think, think, think it through, so we can give enough people the opportunity to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Apostle Selman has walked us through the interconnectedness of man and the relationships and linkages that man has shown um, over the period. He also um, um, exposed us to the history of religion, history of faith in Africa. Some things I had never heard, even though I'm a development um, student. And then he went on to look at Christianity, faith and religion and picked on three poignant points where it has actually, um, where they have played significant roles. Um, education, which we all know, um, health and social services, economic empowerment, and peace and religious um, peace, and peace and religious tolerance. Interestingly, he also looked at the criticisms. So we've not probably done it fully well, um, and then has encouraged each and every one of us to begin to make the right changes. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Please put your hands for Apostle Joshua Selman. Uh, okay, so we're going to be having a very quick fire chat. I will try not to throw the first shot, but I probably have to. Um, and I'll try to be very gentle, sir. But sitting with Professor, with um, Apostle Selman, uh, uh, Professor is not so bad. Yeah, it's not so bad. Okay, um, is Professor Ulupono. His credentials are 
I'll take another 10 minutes to go through that. So permit me not to. Um, he, will, he will be hearing the thoughts from both of them. First shot, and I'm going to look away from my notes. When we look at the growth of Christianity and the growth of um, the development growth of various continents, the three continents that has shown significant growth in religion and in Christianity, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. But the growth in religion in these continents and the economic growth in those in the continents are quite not matching. So I'm just wondering, do you have a thought on why religion is growing in Latin America and economic growth is on the increase? Um, why it's the same with Asia? Asia is, of course, more bludgeoning than the rest of them. And then Africa is not doing so well. Are we missing it somewhere? What are we doing wrong? And what role has religion got to play with it? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, like I said during my lecture, um, nations, one, one of the cardinal, the cardinal reasons why nations become great is the strength of their policies. And policies are a reflection of the convictions it is a man's conviction that is translated to the laws that govern any territory. And so when nations fail, it is not necessarily um, because of faith. It is because of the practice, the way and manner that faith is practiced. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a phone that can be used for both good and evil. A terrorist can use this phone to destroy, for instance, and someone can use this phone to save lives. So whether through destruction or salvation, it still came from the same phone. The, it was just how it was used. So it's been my advocacy, and if you notice in my lecture, I said how that, um, I think the challenge with Africa, in spite of the growing churches, that there has to be a re-examination of the content and the practice of faith. So the problem is not faith in itself, but the approach. For instance, extremisms, for instance, advocacies of hate, for instance, um, wrong teachings, even from the Bible, that have made irresponsible people to become, I mean, to, uh, responsible people to become irresponsible. Uh, when you teach on things like grace and favor and so on and so forth, if not balanced, will put an individual to leave everything about the making of his destiny to the hands of God while not taking responsibility. So I think that um, the, 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 those, who, those who spearhead the faith-based platforms, of course, in addition to the leadership that is largely in Africa. So it's a leadership problem at any level, whether spiritual leadership, economic leadership, political leadership, in one word, the reason for the stuntedness, you know, in spite of spirituality, is leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lukman, can we have your take, too? Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to this forum. I just told uh, Ruth that she's leading a revolution on campus here. She may not know it, uh, but I think we are aware of it. Um, uh, it's a pity that the Dean of Divinity School, uh, Professor Mala Frederick, is not, is not around. He's a professor of Pentecostalism. I would have loved for her to be here because I know that very soon uh, the Divinity School will have the opportunity to hire uh, a professor in global Christianity, which simply means Christianity in the South. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, let me thank you for this very powerful, uh, powerful speech. Uh, the last time we had a Nigerian uh, to give uh, such a lecture here was uh, the Sultan of Sukutu, who gave what they call the Jodidi lecture at the Weatherhead Center. We will surely bring you back. Um, the, the, that was a very interesting question that you posed to us. And I think it relates 
to one of the issues that uh, the apostle mentioned, which I will uh, repose as what we call lived religion, the, the, the praxis itself, where religion is seen, say Christianity, not just as a place where you go to worship or even as a faith you defined, but almost like a heritage that you are born into it and you own it and you claim it and you practice it. We are lacking this and this is the root of our problem. Uh, don't be surprised that myself and a group of people, we have taken the Anglican Church of Nigeria to court here. We've gone to court twice. It's my first time of going to court. But we have to do or to defend the faith, to defend Christianity, Nigerian Christianity in America from, you know, a cash and carry Christianity. So until that kind of thing, that the prophets even talked about the Torah that is in the heart that propels you as a Christian, not what you just hear and you sing and you go home and you think it is finished. This is the kind of revolution that we need. And I think this is what the apostle is all doing. This is my first time of listening to this type of conversation. It's usually a conversation on Christianity given by scholars. And I'm glad you mentioned at least uh, an African uh, scholar, Bediaco, in, you know, in very insightful summary of the history of Christianity. I could also mention my late teacher, Ubukalu, you know, who used to be at the University of Nigeria, Suka, who unfortunately died some years ago. That praxis is important. And that praxis will also translate into governance. Why are the Christians taking bribes? Why are they involved in padding the budget? So that means that, you know, Christianity has not entered into the heart where they are willing to die for what they believe in and they want to be the only person that says, no, I am not going to take this. So uh, we can go on and on. So, so governance is important, but governance that will make you say, I am a Christian. I am not going to take this bribe. I'm here to serve in the Senate as a Christian. I want the transformation of my people and the society. This is where I think we need to go. And these kinds of, of, of training and education, it's not the large cathedrals. We are competing over who builds the largest church in Nigeria when our youth have no jobs. Anyway, let me just say, uh, so this is just... <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I, I, I kept tapping my mic in my head. <laughs> but they didn't get to do it physically. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so, because my time is very limited, I want to know if you could just signify with a show of a hand so I can, so I have one, two, three, four, four questions. Uh, the other hands are coming. Let's take the first four, and then we'll see what more, how much more time I have. Um, I still have my own question, so very brief, very brief. Very brief. Thank you very much. I had the privilege of going to the same university as uh, uh, prophet, uh, I mean Apostle Selman, uh, and not just the same university, but the same faculty. We both were uh, engineering students. So, Apostle, I am just glad that you have taken this dimension to your evangelism, where you are concerned about development, and you are upfront about the fact that there are some of the things that we are not getting right with respect to religion. Growing up in Southern Kaduna from Kaduna State, I have seen a lot. The Sharia crisis you were talking about, I remember my house was burned in that crisis. That is one of the things that actually foiled me from an agri engineer to come here to the Divinity School to have a degree there. I'm interested in understanding how religion can now be used as a force of good. And when I came here and I saw the number of people that we have from the diaspora, I mean in the diaspora who are here at Harvard, I was excited that you have come. Can you please help us and talk to our people who are here in the kind of ways that we need to have synergy in order to build home? 
because it is important. I tell people I want to be here, but home needs me more. Please, yeah. I want, I want, I want a voice. I want a voice that is that is respected to speak to us who are here. What are the ways that we can, yeah, you know. Okay. okay. All right. Um, we'll just take the four so that you can address the first four at once. So here we go. Oh, hello. Um, so I, I, I wanted to know how do we get more spiritual and religious leaders to um, understand like their responsibility is more important than just preaching about preaching the Bible, pretty much like what you were saying, and um, like how do we get them to understand that it's not about building more church buildings, but more church community. So building housing for for members of the church you have people that come to church and they're facing eviction but the church is asking oh bring money so that we could build a new church you know so how do we get them to understand like you talked about it but how do we actually make that happen how how, how do we get to see more leaders actually interested in this development okay thank you very much number three hello so my question is, is not actually a question, is is uh, more or less, I, I want your comment on it. I mean, if, sorry, sorry I was seated. I mean, if religion is based on love and love for God, and Jesus has shown us the biggest um, love of all, he died for our sins, and that is the biggest sacrifice that anybody could show love through. Um, why is it difficult for we as Africans to see ourselves or to show love to each other? Why is it difficult that our politicians, um, if they claim, they claim they are Christians, they are those who, con- who, who give massively to the church, if you go on record. They are the ones who give sure of real, but they, they, they think it's all right to to, to, to sell the resources of Africa for, for pennies over a dollar to countries who, I mean, who, I mean, in the Bible, there were, I mean, uh, the people of Israel were always fighting, I mean, I mean uh, uh, um, there were always conflicts on land and whatever. So meaning that it's actually biblical that every country wants to gain something. So we as Africans, if we are not protecting ourselves from what, uh, I'm sorry, Mm. I mean, if we are not protecting ourselves, it's actually biblical to fight for for land, for resources, for for their people, do you understand? So if they giving you bribe is what will make you sell, they will do it. But we as African leaders, why are we sitting? Why are we deciding to sell our resources for people who just also want to um, who, who want something better for their own people? It's 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 if we think love is what we we stand for as Christian, we call ourselves Christian. It's I, I'm so sorry. My name is Tasha. I'm I'm a doctor from Ghana. And I'm doing my, my master's here in, in global health. And I'm so passionate about Africa. So forgive me, I'm shaking right now because these are issues. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll take the last question before we hand the microphone from over to... Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. So my, my question is just straightforward. Um, you mentioned some scholars during your lecture that talk about um, Christianity in Africa and it's not about colonization and all that stuff. Do you mind just repeating those names? Because I got one down, but I missed some, because I would like to follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Apostle, over to you, sir. Thank you. So let me start with the last person. I left uh, about two or three copies of my lecture notes behind, so um, so you can have, yes. So that, that, that solves that. But then um, I think I'm really touched by I'll try to just weave the three questions together because they're all interconnected. First, for you, um, may, I re- may I request that if you can have access to a platform, please listen to my message, my teaching, my talk, 
how nations are built. Um, this was an Independence Day discussion in Nigeria, and that came by studying America. I took a study on America to know why America is America, and I came up with about five to six factors. Number one being the strength and the quality of the policies. Every nation is as powerful as the policies they build and allow to find expression. And policies don't fall from heaven, if for want of word. Policies are a reflection of the understanding, the orientation, and the conviction of a people. What you believe in is what is translated into law and governs your environment. And so for uh, the gentleman asking the question, I think the first key to creating any change is to become the example of what you want to advocate. It is stronger when you are the transformed person, so you allow people to look at your life. Um, your life becomes a vista. It becomes the clearest portrait of what you are selling. And so most times, I see your being here, and for all of you who are of the African descent, I salute your love and labor uh, and in all that you are doing here because this for me is a representation of your commitment to making Africa better. Talking about it, whining and complaining like many do, unfortunately, will not get the job done. Yeah, so you are taking it a step further and investing in knowledge, learning, you know, relating with and so the 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 kind of I, I don't know how many presidents have come out from here and so you're dealing now with minds uh, where the the limitations of culture the limitations that have come as a result of biases uh, mediocrity and all kinds of sentiments have been taken away largely I assume so in learning you are able to interact with global perspectives now from that standpoint you will clearly see the flaws that have come upon the African continent then from your transformation you come up with programs um, the change cannot happen until your approach is systematized you see that you systematize your approach by building programs that reflect your approach and I will tell you something about transformation transformation is one person at a time most people do not understand the power of one one million is one plus one help me plus one plus one every one you take out of one million stops it from being one million did you get that so if you say one is so insignificant reduce one from one million it can never be called one million again what makes one million one million is the strength of many ones you see that so for every one person you change every one person who your transformative programs affect you are increasing the momentum for territorial transformation i think most people and especially those of us who are at the Afri of the african descent we are used to big things because big houses so we do not respect the power of small constructive in uh, effective progress you know if your house is small something is wrong with you your car is small something is wrong with you and so if you have a chance to transform people like the minds in this room now you would prefer to make noise around a stadium than to constructively distill your knowledge to people who uh, can create um, something that is potent. So for you, sir, my advice would be to continue what you are doing. You have to gain the advantage of relating with global minds. And this is what this platform provides. And so from the lens of those minds, you can come up with programs and probably tailor make it to suit the African continent. There are so many things we do. I'll give you an example. I hope I'm not wasting your time, am I? So I decided to come up with a program. My hometown back in northern Nigeria, uh, because of the, the um, 
ancient history of traditional practices, the worship of the dead, and so on and so forth. In fact, some of those people have children who are purported to be the ones who become extensions of all these idol things. And so because of that, they are not allowed to participate in secular education and several other things. And I decided to come up with an approach to deal with this. First, because uh, I am one person who believes in the power of faith and spirituality. So our approach was prayers. You see that now? This is my approach. But then we did not stop there. We went ahead to begin to, uh, right now we're doing, I don't know number what now, but the project was to build a number of boreholes and uh, transformative projects. And once people begin to see you translate spirituality to a context they can relate with, now they are ready to listen. Even if they won't believe, they will respect the fact that there are fruits to your advocacy. It's not blind fanatism. We began to lead a campaign of scholarships um, from the, the, the elementary stages to the advanced stages, now to college. Um, we've invested massively in all kinds of things, widows, orphans, uh, very serious transformative projects. And then I had a meeting with the, all the traditional rulers, all of them, and decided to challenge them that it's time to begin to advocate a new order of things that they must begin to probe into some of these practices they inherited we must begin to use facts and figures to find out has this worked in the last hundred years and if not can we begin to at least be flexible enough to reconsider other superior options and in the presence of a few things that you may have done it now gives them the motivation to say look if this man has done this this far and this has come as a result of the fruit of your orientation. Let's give it a try. And I can tell you, it's, it's remarkable what is going around my place right now. We've invested so much uh, in the prison, say, in Zaria, northern Nigeria. Um, I have a very strong relationship with the people. Uh, we've provided all kinds of things, generators, food, every time during Salah, during Christmas, in in our social responsibility, we never, never bring prejudices of religion. Never. And so you would find me with um, the Muslim leaders and all kinds of people. I greet them. I joke with them. I pray with them. In fact, one of my closest friends in northern Nigeria uh, is a Muslim. He has a school. He has a hospital. And during my birthday last year, he wanted to buy me a Quran, a Bible, and a Torah. But he didn't know how I would feel about it. And I told him, I said, next time, go ahead. You're talking to a sensible person. Just because I'm a Christian didn't mean I threw away my reasoning. You just let me have those materials, and I'll consult them as occasion serves. So I think that um, um, we have to contend for transformation. Many people who see the need for change are not transformed enough to respond to that change. Did you get what I said? That answers the other question, my dear. And so if we are to create a debate say, on social media, you'll be amazed at the number of unintelligent people who will be interested in responding. But it ends up as noise coming from different angles. The reason is because everything depends on transformation. You cannot change a system you are currently a victim of. You have to come out of that system mentally you see that then you will now be able to create programs that gradually, it won't happen overnight, I can tell you, gradually begins to influence the system. Uh, for those of you who are uh, particular about the spread of Christianity, my apologies for just stretching a bit. I just wanted to bring perspective to what you were saying. Um, Jesus started with 12 disciples. Am I right on that? And then... You know, the Bible and Christian writings would tell us that then 120 people, look how small they were. But look how detailed he was in instilling his mindset and helping them understand the project. And it didn't fail. You see that now. So imagine that he tried to do that to the 5,000 he fed. He only fed them and let them go home. But when it had to do with building people who advocate his ideas, he took time. Even when he resurrected, he said, look, uh, leave my resurrection, get together. I need to talk to you. And he spent 40 more days helping them. So I think that that is the 
idea that we must have everyone who participated in this lecture and this talk you must believe that you're not just a number in the midst of many until you see yourself as an advocate that can bring change remember my example of one million and one so you are one but you are a significant one do you know why because you are one who is in an ongoing process of constructive transformation this is what makes one person to be as strong as a nation nations were changed by many but they were changed by one south africa was changed by many but changed by one great people like mahatma gandhi and um you know and all of the people who have who have advocated social transformations they didn't do it alone but they started it and they maintained the momentum i hope i've been able to attempt these questions yes. thank you very much um, if, you don't, if you don't mind let me also add that even within nigeria there are great role models in our history in contemporary history Francis Ibiam in the East, Aminu Kano in Northern Nigeria, Awolo in Southwestern Nigeria, the most hated person there. If not for the program that he established, we will not be here. You can't explain Southwestern transformation without going back to that man who, just like a leader, and lived by examples. He was so good that. Politicians in Abuja were saying, oh, we hear it doesn't do my nice. How can you be a politician and be staying with one wife? The kinds of useless debate they were making. <laughs> when the man was busy transforming southwestern Nigeria. So we, what I'm trying to say to you is that also look inward, that within the country itself, there are great men and women who played important roles that we are able to emulate. And this you also serve as examples for us. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please, one more time, can we put our hands together for these very distinguished personalities? I, I didn't hear those round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I will crave your indulgence one more time before I leave the podium, uh, and that is, and I know I'm going to be flogged for this. That's why I'm looking forward and not backwards. Look, she has had sleepless nights trying to put this together. I know no one is going to get the opportunity to give her a round of applause. So one more time for Professor Mrs. Okediji. Sit, 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 sit. No, no, sit. everybody that's it that's it that's it um i want to say thank you apostle so i was born in zaria hello hello my house is nil but you know i gotta claim it i have to claim it um professor lupona thank you um, you know the thing about harvard is that it has a mantle for leadership and as you know, um, there are many people flying in, driving in from all over the US and Canada to come here, Apostle Selman. We wanted this event to be focused on Harvard, on students, on people who are connected to an institution that has a mantle and a legacy. And so know that you are here by appointment and by assignment. And know that because that is the reality, you have a responsibility to your generation, to your community. It is not enough to hear, we must be doers. And so I really want to encourage you to sit. You know, we are an academic institution, and so what do you do when, after class? You take your notes, and when you're studying for exams, you go over them. You distill, you take lessons that you can run with. I love, there's a verse that I love. It says, write the vision, make it plain so that people can read and run with it. And this is what Professor Lupuna has also reminded us, that we tend to look at ourselves um, as small, unimportant, overlooked, that nothing you can do can make a difference. 
But the fact of the matter is that every drop of water contributes to the full pot. And I just loved you encouraging our young people, our young leaders in the making, leaders now, the power of one. The power of one. It's great that you've got a Harvard degree, but frankly, just you and what God has put in you for your generation is plenty. It takes a seed. Every tree you see out there had one tiny seed to start it. So we're wrapping up. There's some food you can grab and eat on your way out. I know students are always hungry. We wanted to give you something to eat. Um, can we say thank you again to the Apostle and Professor Lupona? One last thing that I want to say to all of you, um, everything Apostle Selman lectured on today is true about America. This is a church problem. It's a faith problem. And the same challenges that we are seeing and that Apostle Selman mentioned in the context of the Global South and Sub-Saharan Africa, we are seeing it in the U.S., in this land as well. And we don't have the time. We're going to bring him back for another lecture. But there is a global component to this call for leadership. And so as you are going about your studies and as you are thinking and praying and, and just yielding yourself to the gifts and the talents that you have, remember that as you begin here, that there are nations that are going to be affected by the power of one. And that one may just be you. Thank you for being with us today. All right, eat, eat, go to the back, grab food and run. <laughs>